artist, curator, and professor of art at Boston College. She works in many media, including video, smoke, drawing, animation, live flowers, and light projections. You obviously see, see some of her work there tonight. Uh, she's had numerous solo exhibitions and has exhibited widely at commercial galleries, museums, and universities in the U.S. and internationally, including the Moving Image Festival, London, the Institute of Contemporary Art, the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, Crystal, Bridge, uh, Crystal Bridges Museum, Arkansas, and the Dodge Gallery in New York City. Gallagher is the co-curator of the Becker Collection, a private archive of Civil War drawings currently touring the United States. It's the largest such collection, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, together with Richard, uh, she co-directs the Guestbook Project, about which I think we'll hear a bit tonight. Richard Kearney holds the Charles B. Selig Chair of Philosophy at Boston College and has served as visiting professor at University College Dublin, the University of Paris Sorbonne, uh, the Australian Catholic University, and the University of Nice. He is the author of over 20 books on European philosophy and literature, including two novels and a volume of poetry, and has edited or co-edited uh, co uh, 14 more. I think he, um, uh, he embodies what we call the, the Renaissance man. Uh, he was formerly a member of the Arts Council of Ireland, the Higher Education Authority of Ireland, and chairman of the Irish School of Film at the University of College Dublin. Uh, University of College Dublin. He is also a member of the Royal Irish Academy. As a public lecturer in Ireland, he was involved in drafting a number of proposals for a, North, a Northern Irish Peace Agreement in 83, 93, 95. He's presented five series on culture and philosophy for Irish and British television and broadcasts extensively in uh, the European media. He's currently international director of the Guestbook Project, hosting The Stranger Between Hostility and Hospitality. Richard Kearney uh, currently lives in Boston, Massachusetts, where he is married to Anne Bernard, uh, and has two daughters, Simone and Sarah. So, ladies and gentlemen, please a warm welcome to our two guests. Thank you very much, um, Adam, for for inviting us this evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and. Um, We'd also like to thank uh, Jackie and Sarah for, for being wonderful hosts here at Kabia. Um, I'll just say a few words and then pass you on to Sheila, who will speak a little bit about the images that you're going to see this evening. Um, first of all, just to say thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure for us to be here. It's almost a miracle that we're here for a number of reasons. One being that Sheila showed up at the airport with no passport or ID. <laughs> um, so they had to hold the plane and the gates. Uh, there was great melodrama as they finally got her through. It's a long saga as how she convinced them that she really was Sheila Gallagher. She made it onto the plane, made it here. And uh, hasn't actually slept for two nights because two days ago when she was saving all her work, all her images, from one computer to another, one code to another, and we'll corrupt files, and she lost everything and had to start from scratch. So it's going to be quite experimental this evening <laughs> as we patch everything back together again. And um, what we're experimenting with has gone by several names, and you know, if you can think of a better one, do tell us afterwards, a multimedia event, a performed talk, a word image experiment, and so on and so forth. But it's a mixing, basically, of word and stories with uh, moving images and still images and GoPro images that Sheila will be, will be mentioning in a moment. The talk will be in two parts. Uh, the first, entitled Transforming Trauma in Greek Myth and Ritual. And the second, Transgen Transgenerational Memory in 1916, <clears throat> which um, includes two pieces from a larger work that myself and Sheila performed in 1916 uh, in 18 cities in Europe and North America, uh, starting the Abbey Theatre in Dublin for the centenary commemoration of 1916, the rebellion that brought about Irish independence, in the form of a double remembrance of both the Irish who fought against Britain in Dublin to bring about Irish national independence, but also the Irish, almost a quarter of a million of them, who fought um, uh, in British uniform uh, in the hopes that by fighting with Britain against Germany, they would actually bring about 
the, the, the liberation of Ireland. And this was kind of, in many instances, a tragic split in families and homes and communities where one was wearing an Irish uniform, one wearing a British uniform. So we'll be drawing in the second part from two uh, stories uh, taken from that show. Um, so I think that's about it. Uh, we're going to, uh, it'll run to about an hour and 10 minutes, and then we will uh, hopefully have some time for question and answer, and we'd be really delighted to do that with you, because I think the implications of what we're trying to explore and experiment with here, which is, a which is art as a form of healing with regard to wounds and scars, applies not just to the examples we're taking, mainly Greek and Irish-British today, but also to so many incidents uh, here in America and in other parts of the world, Holocaust, genocides, and so on. So that we might get a, an opportunity to compare and contrast what we're doing with those other forms of, of deep historical trauma. And we'd be we'd very much invite your, your views and responses on that. But over to you, Jean. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for being here. And it's a real thrill. I wish um, I, wish I hadn't. Uh, experience these little setbacks the last two days because I don't think I've ever been in a space that would be better suited for this kind of work than this space and a special thanks to um, to Jackie and to Sarah and who everybody's been sort of picking up the file pieces in the last 24 hours. Um, uh, where, where to begin? The image that you're seeing here um, is a very personal image. Um, it's a shrine that was made in the woods this um, fall after a great artist friend of mine, Deb Todd Wheeler, who's over there, her, her 18 year old son went to bed on a Sunday night and did not wake up on a Monday morning out of um, an undiagnosed heart condition. And during this time, I'd actually been preparing for a show which examined the role of the art object um, in memory and in healing and in commemoration. And I had to throw away a lot of what I was, was doing, actually, because this, this event struck our community, our artist community, to the, to the core. Um, so part of what you're seeing tonight, uh, the, you'll be seeing a video that was, came out of um, when all of these artists got together and we filled a church with flowers and then we took all the flowers out and we, we um, draped them in the woods and it continues to be a place of pilgrimage for people to go back to. And this notion of, um, of the shrine or art uh, being a um, place that you, a, a temple that you go to for healing that entails a journey, an object, and the role of the unconscious. And those are three themes that you'll see us um, exploring through the personal, through the philosophical, and through the historical over the course of the evening. So, um, and then we end with a video um, that came out of our work with Twins and Minds, uh, dealing with, with recovering history in um, Ireland in 1916. Um, so you'll see me doing a variety of things. Some are canned, some are, I have a live feed going on here where I manipulate objects and, and draw. And um, it's probably not as smooth as it always is, but in the spirit of experiment, um, thank you for coming and really look forward to hearing your reactions. So. <laughs> We're ready when you are, Sheila. You're ready. Okay. So the question that Sheila and I will be exploring here tonight is this. How, if at all, can art respond to wounds which seem to defy meaning and language? Traumatic wounds, trauma is Greek for wound, are by definition unspeakable, unthinkable, and irrepresentable. And we might add incurable. Yet from the earliest works of Western art and literature, we find examples of healing through poesis, reimagining wounds through images and stories. The Greeks call this poetic healing catharsis, and modern trauma therapists from Freud to Kathy Carus, Bessel van der Falk, and Judith Harmon have developed this insight into a radical method of healing through remembrance. In our presentation here this evening, Sheila and I propose to explore how cathartic imagination may operate as some kind of poetics of memory. We ask, in short, how art might offer possibilities of transforming incurable wounds of trauma 
into healable scars of remembrance, if such a thing is possible. So let me begin with one of the earliest works of imagination, the Odyssey. The name of Homer's hero, Odysseus, actually means bearer of pain. He carries wounds both suffered and inflicted by his forebears. At the beginning of the epic, Odysseus seeks to absent himself from the wounds of his birth, his earthly origins in Ithaca, sailing off to heroic glory and conquest. But his attempts to become an immortal warrior are constantly thwarted by reminders again and again of his mortality, the brutal carnage of Troy in particular, and then subsequent calamities and failures. The decisive break in the story comes with the rupture of the lure of Calypso. And this process of disillusionment culminates in Odysseus choosing ordinary mortal nourishment over the temptation of divine ambrosia. He accepts his mortality and returns to Ithaca at the very end of the story, no longer a delusional mighty hero, but a beggar, a lowly outcast recognized only by the smell of his flesh, by his dog Argos, and the touch of the scar on his thigh by his nurse Eurotia. The healing touch occurs significantly during a therapeutic act of remembering, where Eurotia recounts for Odysseus how he had received the original wound in a childhood hunting accident with his grandfather, Autolycus. The climactic moment of recognition takes the form of a catharsis where the hero comes to self-knowledge by both acknowledging and embodying the story of his wounding in his car. Amnesia gives way to anamnesis, namely the healing power of remembrance. First, Eurotia recognizes him as she bathes his feet, maimed by a sword at his birth, and then confirms the memory when she touches his scar and recalls his childhood injury, thereby inviting Odysseus to relive his wound across time, in retrospect, a narrative detour which enables him to encounter the ghosts of his past. In the final analysis, then, Odysseus can only recover his life in Ithaca when he recognizes his own wounds and receives healing through an act of recollection. And by poetic extension, we may say that each reading of the story of the Odyssey down through the centuries is an invitation to each one of us to participate in the art of healing memory. Now, in the Poetics, Aristotle famously describes this catharsis as what he calls the purgation of pity and fear. Such purging of our most deeply felt passions, pity and fear, is to be understood not as a quick fix, some kind of facile closure, but rather as an open-ended process of working through what Freud had called Durcharbeiter. Catharsis signals a two-fold transformation of our wounded passions, namely the distilling of one pathological pity into compassion, and B, of pathological fear into serenity. Compassion, that is purged pity, spells a purified way of being, near to pain, being touched by suffering, without being overwhelmed by suffering. In other words, a liberty afforded by the formal mediation of art. While for its part, serenity enables us to keep a healthy but humane distance from pain, lest we over-identify or fuse with the other's wounds. Now, this double catharsis secures a proper balance between far and near, detachment and empathy, which, according to Aristotle, makes for healthy human beings, and which is enabled by the fact that pity and fear are being enacted and reenacted by the characters on stage. So we revisit the real through the imaginary reenactment of the passions. And our pathological passions of pity and fear become humane passions of compassion and detachment, serenity. Purge suffering leads to practical wisdom, to the working through of our art. And in the great theaters of Epidaurus and Athens, Greek citizens witnessed epics unfold before their eyes as they came to terms with the unspoken wounds of their collective past. Now, one of the most famous figures of Greek tragedy was, as you all know, Oedipus. Sophocles' play, Oedipus Rex, exemplifies how art serves to transform wounds into scars. 
It's been noted by the anthropologist Levi Strauss, the proper name for Oedipus, the proper names for Oedipus and his patrilinear ancestors all refer to wounds which cause difficulty in walking. Lapticus, lame. Lyas, left-sided. Oedipus, swollen-footed. His feet were pierced with a spear when he was a child. Each of these figures reiterates the violent crimes of the previous generation. Lyas, the grandfather, raped the son of his host, Pelops, thereby committing the equivalent of incest in the betrayal of hospitality. His double transgression replicates the curse of his own father, Lapticus, and is repeated by Oedipus in the next generation. Now, this fatal transgenerational maiming comes under the heading of the House of Lapticus and involves a recurring acting out of unspoken traumas one generation after the next. So this recurrence of trauma inflicted or suffered takes place over three generations, and the only antidote to this curse of cyclical repetition is, it appears, when Oedipus himself assumes his inheritance of wounding and turns it into mourning. That is, when he wounds himself, forfeiting normal sight, which had prevented him from seeing truth, and finding real insight through this blinding. It's only, in other words, when Oedipus uncovers the reality of his forgotten origins that he can actually recover truth. The final reckoning with trauma, epitomized by the recognition of his scarred feet and the removal of his eyes, leads ultimately not to curing. That's impossible. His fate is set and his eyes are gone forever. But to a certain healing, a vision witnessed in his final words of Colonus, where he accepts his strange status as a mortal human. In sum, Oedipus's wound has become a scar, a cathartic witness for later generations. His empty tomb serves as a memorial shrine for Athens. From the earliest myths, then, it seems that a primary purpose of art is to address at a symbolic level what cannot be resolved at a literal level, namely the basic trauma of our terrestrial existence, our being born as wounded ones from the earth while always struggling to negate our mortal condition. Myths function, in Levi Strauss's words, as I quote, machines for the suppression of time, which is another way of saying the Greek myths and drama were arts for transforming pain into fantasy, trauma into remembrance. Now, the stories of Oedipus and Odysseus were frequently performed down through the ages in the famous amphitheater of Epidaurus. And it's significant that this most ancient of all Greek theaters is named after the disciple of the celebrated heaters, Asclepius and Chiron. So let's say a word about each of these famous Greek leaders. Chiron was a demigod and a centaur, half man and half horse. He was wounded by Heracles during a boar hunt when a poisoned arrow struck his leg and would not heal. Though Chiron could not cure himself, he found that he could cure others and became known as a wise and compassionate healer. He took the pain into himself and felt it daily in such a way that he could take away others' pain. Heart speaking to heart. In his wounded presence, sufferers felt whole and well. Chiron relinquished his immortality and underwent death, eventually being assigned a place among the stars as the constellation Centaurus. Chiron taught his disciple, Asclepius, the art of healing through one skillful touch, Chiron means hand, Chiron, and B, through artistic imagination, Chiron healed with music and dream images, accompanied by his assistant, Onira, whence our word oniric or dreamlike. By contrast, Hippocrates, the other patron of Western medicine, followed the way of Zeus. Chiron's brother, Zeus was Chiron's brother, who dwelt on Mount Olympus and promoted a method of managerial superintendence and control. In short, while Asclepius promoted healing through the oniric unconscious and contact with the earth below, symbolized by the figures of the snake and the dog, and indeed the rooster, Hippocrates promoted curing through inspection and intervention from above. Or again, while the sleeping healing worked through nocturnal imagination in terrestrial caves and underground wells, 
as in the famous temple at Lissas on Crete, which you can visit to this day. Hippocratic curing operated through cognitive management up there in Olympian life. In addition to inviting the sick to revisit their repressed dream consciousness, Asclepius also learned from his mentor Chiron, remember a hybrid, a hybrid of human and animal, how to reconnect sufferers with their embodied wounds. A son of Philira, lover of music, Chiron taught Asclepius an alternative remedy to the compulsive and often violent repetitions of chronological time. That remedy being the art of tactile caring and dreaming. Unlike his brother Zeus then, who gave rise to the Hippocratic tradition of curing and managing pain, and cognizing it, of course that's necessary too. Unlike his brother Zeus, who continued the periodic blood cycle in terms of the myth of father-son castration, Pronos castrates his father Uranus, Zeus castrates his father Pronos, Chiron, the son of Zeus, chose a very different route. He put an end to the compulsive repetition of patricidal wounding, giving birth instead to a daughter, Hygieia, priestess of healing through water, whence her word, Hygieia. Hygiene. But what's more, in renouncing the vicious cycle of father-son violence, Chiron taught Asclepius how to assume wounds into his own flesh. Instead of acting on traumas violently on others, wounded healers, like Chiron and Asclepius, transform wounds by the art of empathy. Trauma speaking to trauma through dream, touch, and song. Pindar speaks accordingly of wise-hearted Chiron, who taught Asclepius the soft fingered skills of medicine's roar. End quote. Or as another poet, Leonard Cohen, put it, also speaking of wounds, speaking to wounds, ring the bells that still can ring, there is a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in, is healing in and through the wound. This is Hygieia with her snake, the daughter of Chiron. Another Greek, sorry, ancient Greek, ancient, let me take it again, ancient Greece was replete with the Asclepian temples where the maimed and sick were invited to return to the earth, their mortal origin and end. And this often took the form of incubation in caves where they were carefully tended until they awoke with dreams which the Asclepian healers would interpret. Sometimes the sleepies himself would appear to the patients in their dreams. But in all cases, the images preceded the words. The visions preceded the talking cure of the attentive priests. And when we come to Freud in a moment, we'll see how, for him, trauma, when he was studying it you know, in the Second World War, when, when veterans were coming back from the front, uh, he, he, he noted that their trauma, which was inexperienced experience at the time in the trenches, came back to them in retrospect, nachträglich, as he put it, first in images and then in words. But first in images. In any case, back to the asleep in cave. The simulated death of incubation was seen as a prelude to the patient's return to health. Such temples also harbored shrines and votive offerings where the sick would come with sculpted representations of illness, often in the form of terracotta votives of wounds, hands, ears, eyes, breasts, and feet. Feet, tokens of earthly mortality par excellence, were extremely frequent, and one finds hundreds of clay feet in the sanctuary of Asclepius at Corinth. We might recall here not just the wounded hoofs of Chiron, a horse, man, god, but also the scarred leg of Odysseus, or the swollen foot of Oedipus, and also indeed the separating limb of Philip Titus, healed by the son of Asclepius, and the main heel of Achilles, chosen disciple of Chiron. In all these mythic figures, wounded feet serve as symbolic reminders of our terrestrial origins. We come from Earth and must accept our finitude if we are to be reborn again. We have to die to be reborn. An incubation in the cave was a form for the Asclepian uh, patient uh, of, of dying to the darkness to, to live again. 
The healing sought from Asclepius and supplication of thanks pertain to both physical and psychic trauma. In short, the working through of pain involved the creation of art objects which represented internal ex and external bodily parts, internal organs or feet, hands, limbs. The offering of these anatomical uh, votives was central to the Asclepian practice. And it's telling that Epidaurus, Asclepius's special disciple, became patron of the arts of drama, hence the famous theatre called opera, involving poetry, dance, masks, and sculpture, a multimedia experiment, if ever there was one. It's worth recalling for a moment the actual makeup of Asclepian sanctuaries. These were known as the Asclepians. And in the main, the Asclepian at Epidaurus, still existent to this day, rituals began with purification in a series of cleansing baths, accompanied by a special herb diet, after which the supplicants were admitted to the inner shrine. Here they offered clay or metal sculptures of the body parts to Bikini as they entered the Abaton for one or more nights, a dream incubation center chamber, where they hoped to receive a healing vision from Asclepius. Often in the oniric dream guise of one of his totem animals, the dog, the rooster, or the snake. The main conditions for such Asclepian rites included a journey to the shrine on foot, a site of natural beauty usually comprising water springs and underground grottos, the votive offering of sculpted objects and figurines, and then a deep dream therapy involving symbolic interpretation through memory and weaving. It's also to be noted that healing did not come to any pilgrim alone. It was always in the company of others, whether fellow patients or healers. This communal aspect was key to the theatrical experience of catharsis central to Greek ritual. This combination of community art and the unconscious is for the most part something missing from mainstream healthcare today, with the exception of certain pioneers of trauma therapy. I mentioned some in the beginning. Freud was, of course, one of those who led the way, going beyond the conventions of Hippocratic medicine, in which he was schooled and trained as a doctor, to retrieve aspects of his sleeping healing in psychoanalysis. He was well aware of the practices of incubation and dream interpretation as ancient antidotes to neurosis caused by blocked or repressed memories. This is written up by Sharon Poole in a wonderful um, essay, The Soother of Evil Pains in Sleepius and Freud. Freud showed how healing memory, what he called mourning, revisits and reverses the original fixations of pathological memory, what he called melancholia. He wrote a famous essay called Mourning and Melancholy. The only cure to bad memory, in other words, is good memory like the hair of the dog that bit you. The art of remembrance undoing the illness of obsession and compulsion. In short, where melancholy clings to a lost object or trauma in anxiety, mourning is a form of remembering that pain while freely recalling it in order to let it go and begin one's life again. Although Freud was a qualified medical scientist, he was the artist in it who earned the Nobel Prize for literature, not medicine. Moreover, arts, uh, Freud's study was full of anatomical photos and various art objects from the culture. Another indication of Freud's escaping activities may be witnessed in his discovery of the key role played by an object, a symbolic cotton wheel, in the healing of his grandson, Ernst. As Freud was composing the first great work of trauma therapy, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, in 1916-1920, in response to traumatized veterans returning from World War I, he happened to observe his 80-month-old grandson, who he was babysitting, playing with a spool of thread while uttering the words, Thought da, gone here, the title of Sheila's recent show. Freud quickly realized that the child was using this imaginary play as a compensatory stand-in for the disappearance and reappearance of his mother, Sophie Freud, which little Ernst simply couldn't handle the anxiety. Here, his mother's there, he's clinging to her, now she's gone. She's back, she's gone. But by casting the object 
the coffin spool away from him until it disappeared under his car, shouting, thought, gone. And then reeling it back into visible reach with the word da here again. The child was imitating the otherwise uncontrollable coming and going of his mother. Thus was founded modern drama therapy, the shortest story ever told. Gone here, a two-syllable act, a word and image, voice and object, combined to perform an art of compensation and healing. The fictional scene of make-belief bestowed <coughs> upon the anxious child the basic power of the artist. Ernst ceased to cry hysterically at the absence of his mother and played away in peace. His micro-drama worked. Catharsis happened. Indeed, we might well rename Freud's portrayal of this primal scene of his grandchild as the portrait of an artist as a young child. In Sheila's most recent art work, art exhibition, Gone Here, uh, which opened in, in the Hudson, in Hudson in New York in, in, in last year, last fall, we witness a similar, if unique, examination of the role of the art object in memory and healing. For her exhibition, Sheila created a dream play of images in response to a series of recent traumas. As she mentioned earlier, the death of her best friend's son in Boston, as well as the illnesses of friends and family and the discovery of bodies of unwanted babies in a village in Ireland called Chun. In Sheila's fought down, one finds an altar made of gold-leafed cement blocks covered with clay and porcelain organs and limbs. As in the Scipions, there is an aspect of the communal involved in any public exhibition or performance. The gallery becomes a secular shrine for a shared art experience to which every spectator and passerby is invited. And yet, as art, the exhibition is neither a religious rite, one does not have to believe in a religious creed, nor a group therapy session covered by health insurance. Mm -hmm. Gallagher, the artist, is neither physician nor priest, and yet an art of remembrance is at work here too with potentially cathartic implications. And it's worth considering how, in a post-religious society like ours, a piece of art like Shalom Namaja, which you will now see and hear, might serve as a replacement ritual for a lost loved one, set to a musical lament by Irla O. Leonard. The Gaelic title translates roughly as Goodbye, Farewell, Gone. This piece uh, was one of uh, the works uh, exhibited in Sheila's show come here.
I might just uh, mention that the, the shrine that you see there um, with the flowers and the uh, deck in the shrine is the same shrine um, that Sheila mentioned with the opening image, which of course resembles in, in its own way a Stephen shrine. And the, the flowers, the, the, the red and the white of, of Eros and Thanatos of, Dirt, of death and, and rebirth are also echoed, as you see, and as kind of signposts to his. In the final video, which we, we conclude um, uh, our talk, uh, which represent the lily and the, uh, the poppy, the lily worn by Irish Republicans, um, representing those who died fighting against Britain in Dublin, the Irish, and the poppy representing those who died with Britain. And normally these are seen as completely mutually exclusive. But in the video and in our Prince and Mind's performance, we, we uh, crossed both, which I think art can do, politics can't. We had a war in Ireland for 30 years because the Lillian and the poppy could not, could not speak to each other. But um, art, in our own small little way, we were drawing from a lot of Irish artists and poets who have begun to cross cultures and cross narratives. But this brings me to uh, the uh, second part, the final part uh, of our uh, event this evening, which uh, concerns transgenerational memory in 1960. And that will conclude with the, with the video I just mentioned, Sheila's video. So, in the second part, we turn to art as a healing of historical trauma. More particularly, we look at the work of transgenerational memory in the context of British Irish relations around World War I. In 2016, Sheila and I embarked on a collaboration as mentioned <coughs> called Twins and Minds, a project which experimented with artistic retrievals of trauma in 1916, 100 years previously. Our multimedia performance comprised a double act of remembrance, recovering lost stories and images from both the battlefields of World War, World War I and the bloody streets of Dublin's rising. This commemorative project was performed in 18 venues in Britain, Ireland, Europe, and North America exploring the arts as a multimedia means of transnational healing. We were especially interested in looking at the difference between good and bad commemorations, based on the persuasion that making history also entails remaking it, giving futures to aborted pasts. Just as we make art, we also make history. We make up our minds, it's a poesis. A task which involved remembering not only forgotten wounds, but also past dreams that never saw the light of day. For genuine commemoration, you believe, means attending not only to what happened, but also to what did not happen. Possibilities which live on in memory thanks to arrows of futurity which were interrupted at the time. It signals, in short, a work of both restorative memory and anticipatory memory, those potential possible futures that never were realized. Let me give some background. For over 100 years, generations of Irish and British citizens experienced deep splits regarding their respective historical memories, nationalist and unionist, Republican versus loyalist, Catholic versus Protestant. Back in the days of 1916, many joined the Dublin Rebellion against Britain, an event deemed decisive in the formation of the modern Irish nation. Well, in the very same year, many others, often from the same home, street, or parish, opted to join the opposite side. They enlisted in the British Army in order, one, to earn a living, two, to fight for the freedom of little nations like Belgium and so on against Germany, German Empire, and also, many believed, to endorse the British promise to grant home rule for Ireland. The thinking being, if we fight with Britain against Germany, the English will reward us, the Irish, by granting us independence. As it happened, countless Irish lives were sacrificed on both sides. Almost 500 during Easter week alone in Dublin, and over 5,000 in a single day, in fact, in three hours, in the Battle of the Somme in France. In fact, the total number of Irishmen killed in British uniform World War I 
was close to 50,000, a staggering number of dead who never received the public recognition of sacrifice afforded to the martyrs of the Dublin Rising. In other words, the Dublin Rising was commemorated with the lily, the white lily, as we see, whereas the Irish who fought British uniform were commemorated, if they were commemorating it at all, like the poppy, the red, red and black one. The Irish refusal to commemorate their World War I dead left deep, deep psychic wounds for decades, with ruinous consequences in terms of mental illness, suicidal depression, alcoholism, civil war, and the contentious partition of the island of Ireland, issuing in the 30 year troubles of recurring violence and bloodshed in the 60s, right up to the end of the 90s. Twinson Mines, our show, sought to explore possibilities of healing by a cathartic working through of transgenerational memory. Such therapeutic work, we believe, was necessary for the health not just Ireland and Britain, but any nation, because repressed wounds maim the psyche and return to haunt us again and again. An art is a way of remembering so as to turn those ghosts back into ancestors that we can name and own and bury. Which is why historical dramas, dramas need to be reworked in imagination as an art of remembrance. Our commemoration of both the Dublin Rising and the Battle of the Somme meant going beneath and against the official history of binaries, British versus Ireland, Ireland in order to retrieve forgotten stories of crossing and communion, namely twins and minds. It's a phrase actually from Joyce. In what follows, we cite two such stories, one which occurred in an Irish village, the other in the trenches of France. Winifred Barrington. In 1916, a young Irish woman, Winifred Barrington, aged 23, was volunteering in the ambulance corps of the British Army in France. While she was nursing soldiers in the trenches, she was also writing postcards home to her rebel friend, Mike Hayes, back in her native Irish village, Maru. Winnie, as she was known, traversed boundaries with abandon, ignoring divisions of class and religion. Growing up in Ireland in conflicted times, she defied convention and daily crossed the road separating her ascendancy castle from the Catholic laborers of Maru village. Mike Hayes was her favorite. In the mornings, Winnie brought food to poor families in the hills. <coughs> Afterwards, she rode to hounds with her Protestant neighbors and dined with loyalist landlords. Evenings, she danced with Mike Hayes and his rebel Irish friends on the old platform near Abington Bridge. The Hayes family was well known for its Irish Republican loyalties, but that didn't stop the relationship between Mike and Winnie. And it was reported that on one occasion, when British Crown forces captured an Irish tricolor from Mike, and were holding it as evidence, Winnie visited the barracks and smuggled the flag out in the folds of her petticoat. But her close relationship with Mike Hayes didn't prevent her from also befriending Major Henry Biggs, district inspector of a local British brigade. Biggs captured local IRA men and had them strapped to cars as hostages as he drove through the countryside. But Winifred, we're told, only saw the good side of the 26-year-old Biggs, forming what one neighbor described as an inexplicable friendship between two young people. One day at the height of hostilities, Winnie was invited to tea with British officers in a local mansion, and it was while returning home in a car driven by Biggs that they were ambushed by the IRA. Among the ambush party were Hayes's, but it was never revealed who actually fired the fatal shot. All we can suppose is that some of Winnie's Republican friends were present when she expired. There was no trial, no evidence, and no one involved in the attack was prepared to tell the full story. Not to this day. But there are many different versions of what happened that evening. One account claims that Winnie was dressed in mannish manner, joppers and military cap, and was mistaken for Biggs. Another claims she was having a driving lesson from Biggs, and was sitting beside him at the wheel and got caught in the crossfire. Yet another says she flung herself across his body to prevent him from shot. One of the ambushes is said to have apologized to the dying Winifred as she expired from a bullet through the lung, while another put several more shots into the body, swearing the bitch would have lived if she'd kept better company. No one knows for sure, no one told, but when Winifred was laid out in her Maru home amidst bouquets of rhododendrons, there wasn't a soul from the town that Catholic or Protestant, Republican or Unionist, who did not attend. Passing through Maru village on her way to the cemetery, 
All houses were closed and blinds drawn. The bell of the church tolled until the procession passed out of sight. The money and land for the building of the Catholic Church had been given by Winifred's Protestant father, Sir Charles Farrington, along with the graves where two of the rebel ambushers were later buried. Indeed, Sir Charles offered his own grave and had it lined with the rhododendrons that had bedecked Winnie's tomb. Her killers were buried in her father's grave. Winnie's own epitaph read and reads to this day if you visit the village of Maru in Ireland. I quote, here lies buried all that could die of Winifred Barrington. When Sir Charles left Ireland, consolable at the loss of his daughter, his large house was passed on to Catholic Benedictine monks. Marking the 1916 centenary, members of what is now an abbey recovered a long buried garden named after Winifred. And there they planted 17 silver birch trees, 16 for the 16 executed Irish leaders of 1916, and a 17th for Winnie herself, who befriended Irish rebels and British alike. The poet Fanny Howe wrote this inscription, Winifred means Guinevere, a white phantom. She crossed boundaries without fear. It's telling, we believe, that such a genuine working through of trauma happens well after the event, Nacht Heide, as Boyle would say. For almost a century, the story of Winifred Barrington went completely unremarked. Sometimes it takes decades, even centuries, for deep, deep wounds to be retrieved and transformed. And when such catharsis occurs, it's often, as recent trauma studies show, through the recovery of lost memories. Finally, Francis Leverage. Our second tale of double remembrance involves a poet soldier called Francis Leverage. Here was another tragic Irish soul caught in the crossfire of British Irish relations. A Catholic laborer from Southern Ireland, Leverage first sided with the Irish volunteers in the fight for independence against Britain, before later enlisting the British army in the fight against Germany. Leverage was killed at Boisinger, Flanders, in July 1917. It was the first day of the Third Battle of Ypres, and he was serving with the Royal and Esquilin Fusiliers. Age 29, he was having a tea break and struck by German artillery. He fell at a place called the Cap Four de la Rose, crossroads of the road. A chaplain who knew him, Father de Vass, recorded, Ledwich killed, blown to bits. Today, Ledwich's grave is inscribed with lines from his own poem, Lament for Thomas MacDonough, one of the leaders of the 1916 Rising, whose violent death in Dublin prefigured Ledwidge's own death in Flanders. Ledwidge and MacDonough may have worn opposite uniforms, Irish and British, but they were brothers at heart. I quote Ledwidge's poem, he shall not hear the bittern cry, the bittern is a bird, in the wild sky where he is lain, nor the voices of the sweeter birds above the wailing of the rain. In another poem from Flanders, Lament for the Poets, 1916, Ledwidge confessed empathy for the dreams of the Dublin martyrs at a time when Ireland oscillated between being a country and a nation. If nation is construed as a unitary political ideal, country is a place of natural elements and multiple living things, birds, flora, rivers, trees, people. It knows no borders or boundaries. At break of day, the fowler came and took my blackbirds from their psalms, who loved me well through shame and blame. But in the lovely hush of eve, weeping I grieve the silent hills, the silent peaks. Sixty years on, Irish Nobel laureate, Seamus Heaney, composed a beautiful elegy to Leverage. Written in 1980, at the height of the Ulster Troubles, Northern Ireland, Heaney recognizes a mirror image of this conflicted poet. Revisiting the British Irish split of Ledwidge's wounded psyche at a time when Heaney's own province of Northern Ireland was torn by a new war between the Irish and the British, he performed a healing poetics of memory. Crossing past and present imaginings, Heaney repeats the past forward, turning the wounds of trauma into scars of writing. The elegy functions as a powerful act of 
catharsis. He reimagines that the forlorn and foreign French trenches, which he compares to Irish passage graves of the Boyne, the Boyne Valley, where Ledwidge grew up, the center of Ireland. He quotes a letter from Ledwidge, lamenting his split between the Britain he serves in France and the Ireland he has left behind. Confessing deep inner division, Ledwidge expresses hope for some post-war reunion. I quote, I'm sorry that party politics should ever divide our own tents, but not without the hope that a new Ireland will arise from her ashes in the ruins of Dublin, like the Phoenix, with one purpose. Heaney enters the mind of Ledwidge thus, Ledwidge on the front in the trenches, facing the Germans. The Tommy, Tommy, of course, is British. British uniform. I think of you in your Tommy's uniform, a haunted Catholic face, pallid and brave, ghosting the trenches with a bloom of hawthorn, or silence cord from a boring passage grave. A big strafe puts the candles out in Ypres to be called a British soldier while your country has no place among nations. Heaney locates Leverage's identity crisis in the double culture he grew up in. Irish and British, and he concludes its energy by identifying these strains of cross loyalties as both a conflict in British Irish politics and a cleft in Leverage's own psyche, a double split which tore him to shreds as brutally as the shrapnel from German realms. I quote again, Jamie Senior, you were rent by shrapnel six weeks later, in you our dead enigma, all the strains crisscross in useless equilibrium. I hear again the sure, confusing drum. You were not keyed or pitched like these true blue ones, though all of you consort now on the ground. He thus imagines different soldiers marching to different tunes. Irish people, all reconnected through the underground graves, joining the River Boyne in Ireland to the trenches of France, where they reached down. The poetic crisscrossing of rivers, graves, songs, and uniforms makes for a very powerful art of remembrance, so different from mere empty militaristic monuments. So to conclude, what Sheila and I hope to achieve in our retrievals of these forgotten figures, aided by artists like Heaney and Howe and others, was to turn repressed histories of trauma into stories of healing. In the case of Winnie Barrington, it was widely reported that our Twins and Minds reenactment of her memory in the village of Maru in June 2016 triggered a real catharsis for many of those present. The performance was the first time Winnie's name had been publicly remembered in over a hundred years. The local response was incredibly moving. You could hear a pin drop in the hall where we performed. In the case of Ledwich, the revisiting of his story by Heaney and other contemporary Irish artists has also contributed to the healing of divided memories of both Britain and Ireland, north and south of the border. Indeed, many would argue that the cathartic remembrance of past historical traumas by Irish poets and artists in the 80s and 90s significantly paved the way for the current peace agreement in Northern Ireland, confirmed by both British and Irish governments. In our retrievals of the Barrington and Ledwidge stories in the dark caves of little theaters and galleries and experimental art centers like this. We hope that the sleeping arts of imagination may help inexperienced wounds become experienced scars. The art of remembrance, we believe, go, goes beneath official history to focus on hidden or neglected micro-narratives. Stories which turn backward history, that is, memory addicted to repetition and compulsion, into forward history, memories alert to the futures of the past. The goal then is to transform memories that incarcerate into memories that emancipate, bad commemoration into good commemoration. And this process of therapeutic analysis applies not only to the Irish-British commemoration of 1916, explored briefly just now, but also to many other projects of memorialization. It's no accident, for example, that the most powerful testament to the traumas of apartheid, country of my skull, was written by a South African poet, Angie Kral, and by also psychic Adam Egoyan's extraordinary testament to the Armenian genocide in his film Ararat, not to mention the countless 
writers, artists, and filmmakers who have kept the memory of the Holocaust alive. Amos, Salam, Landsman, Spielberg, Spiegelman, Semtan, and so on. All observing Primo Levi's famous exhortation that we must keep on telling the story of Auschwitz so that it can never happen again. And this in spite of Adorno's famous adage that after the Holocaust, no one can write poetry or make art. But while recognizing that there are limits to the Asclepian arts, silence is sometimes the best response to horror. One cannot deny the call of healing. History needs story to bring the past to life again so that we can feel what wretches feel, empathize with the pain of the persecuted, and be struck by the terror of it all. Or to return to Aristotle's poetics, where we began, we need an artistic plot, what Aristotle called mythos mimesis, to configure past sufferings into a meaningful act of remembrance now. Otherwise, there would be no catharsis, just a bare chronicle of facts, one thing after another. Story and history need each other for unspeakable wounds to become visible, legible stars, scars, for archive to become art. In sum, a poetics of remembrance is necessary for inexperienced experience, which is the definition of trauma, to be re-experienced as art again and again. So we are now finally with the screening of Sheila's, uh, another of Sheila's videos, this time, as I mentioned, from Twins and Minds. And as with other healing journeys discussed here today, in this video we're brought down under the dark into the mytho-imagination, represented here, as we see, by the River Liffey in Dublin, and we're invited to return to the battle sites of trauma. It's a cathartic return, which is wordless, but along the way we're met by signs and symbols, midwives of restorative memory. Here are the motifs of the lily, symbolizing the Irish who died in the rebellion, and the poppy, symbolizing the unmourned Irish who died fighting World War I, are introduced by the raven of Celtic mythology, so the Celtic answer to uh, Asclepius's rooster. Um, the raven of ancient Celtic myth, remember Britain is as Celtic as Ireland and Scotland and Wales, which precedes and exceeds all these national divisions. While the raven is frequently associated with death or sadness, grief is a thing with feathers, it's also represented as a messenger to transform wounds into scars, we must be willing to follow the grief and participate as individuals in community in arts of remembrance. Whether it's moving images, music, poetry, or clay motives, art is an indispensable medium for reading the raven's cries of healing sent from our personal and our collective unconscious.
We have some time, I think, for a few uh, a few questions. And uh, if you don't mind me, can I kick it off with a quick yes, question? Yes, of course. I'm here, Sheila. You have to answer. Yes, too. these are questions actually for the for the both of you. Um, you know, I'm thinking about narrative as a as a as a form of explanation or understanding. Uh, we sometimes talk about narrative explanation or narrative understandings, but sometimes traumatic events, acts of violence seem to be inexplicable and that seems to be part of what uh, perhaps makes it a, a, an evil event you know evil is that it defies any kind of explanation i'm wondering if you um, if, if you if you think that there's a, a different kind of resource that narrative provides um, that would not be equivalent to an understanding um, but that would un nonetheless kind of allow us to work through and how that how that works. Are you Mike? You, you're still Mike. Is that correct? Okay. So so I'll use this microphone uh, for for questions if you if you know if you if you want it. So. Well, I know she does say things say with this, but if, if I might just preface Sheila's response with a few words. I think first of all, it's narrative with a difference. I mean, there are two different kinds of narrative. What we call the grand narratives, and that's official history, and that's where there's explanations for everything. And uh, there's a place for everything, and everything is in its right place. And in one sense, that does an injustice to trauma, because trauma resists that. Right. But there's another kind of narrative, which in French philosophy we call les petits récits, little narratives, of which we translate as micro-narratives, that are about forgotten stories and forgotten people. And uh, that's what we were trying to do in, in the... Um, in, in the Twins and Mines, all the stories we told were ones that had been forgotten by both British official history and Irish official history. And a lot of them actually to do with women who were just written out of, of history. Um, and the Irish who died in British uniform were never mourned, so that they were also the forgotten ones. So we were retrieving stories, but not just as stories. There were stories that were accompanied by uh, images that kept crossing them and interrupting them and preceding them and exceeding them, uh, letting it be known that when trauma comes back, it actually comes back like what we saw there. And in fact, that video that we ended with, uh, Sheila's video, is, is the one we started all our performances of Twins and Minds with. We began with, with images coming from the unconscious and then and only then went went into the narratives that were always accompanied by and crossed with images so it is a form of of narrative but it's like what we might call enabling narrative that undoes disabling narrative right i heard the dog debate like in 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 this performance this evening we're kind of talking about trying to have a good memory coming from the greek mm -hmm. the sleepy tradition of memory uh, that can undo bad memory 
So that's what I'd say by way of redeeming a certain kind of narrative against another kind of narrative, but it's never enough. Mm -hmm. Narrative always comes from silence, ends in silence, and needs music and image and performance, and therefore multimedia, to, uh, to fill it out. And poetry being very important too, because poetry is very is non narrative. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Sheila, you're you're. That, I don't have much to, to add to that except that I do think that I mean, it's part of why I'm here that um, that visual art keeps. Are you mic'd? I can't I'm tell. Not, you're right. okay. I think um, visual art, and particularly still images, keeps narrative honest, um, even micro narratives, because especially when we're dealing with trauma, because narrative always has to have by its very nature a beginning middle and an end and visual art and particularly still images works with a cross section of time uh, simultaneously and trauma how we experience trauma it's never a beginning a middle and an end it's that your um your your present is constantly being revisited by your fear of the past or your anxiety of the of the future and so it's one of the reasons I really believe in the muteness of, of, of the language of, of images, um, especially when it's paired with, with narrative. And what about music added to it? Because I noticed even in my script, as I was saying, you're not going to see mute images, and then we get this beautiful music. So it's wordless, <laughs> it's wordless but it's not entirely mute. I mean, music is OK, right? It is. Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if. Um, uh, thank you for the beautiful presentation, first of all. I was wondering if sometimes uh, you ever think of it in a reverse way from the way you set up your, your title, that the problem of, um, of trauma or mourning is not that you go, is not the, the need to go from wounds to scars but ra and, and uh, narratives of, of mourning, but the need to go from scars back to wounds. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is it seems like um, in, like a, a good example, a, a horrible example is the United States right now, right? Of uh, these mm. repeated murders of uh, innocents again and again. And then we create these narratives uh, to try to cope with them, which are repetitious and ultimately are an attempt to try to find a way to go from wounds to scars to try to find meaning in it. And yet, uh, I guess I'm, I'm like asking like a Brechtian question. Maybe there's something valuable in re-poking that scar and bringing back um, the ugly feelings, the mm -hmm. horrible, unresolved feelings of trauma. But this is problematic because it doesn't seem to go with art, poetry. It seems like kind of a, an ugly aesthetic. Yeah, well, I, think you can go, I think good art and good poetry can be ugly too and can be really difficult and um, and I think what Richard, can I jump in here? I think, course, yeah. I, I think what you're talking about is if, um, if wounds are covered up too soon, yeah. if you don't deal with the ugly, if you don't deal with the complicated histories, if you don't deal, then there's a scar, but there's a festering underneath. And in that case, I think it needs to be, the abscess needs to be punctured. And I think we're definitely in that place right now in, in the United States. And, for instance, this fall, you know, after the Charlottesville, um, you know, after the Charlottesville disaster, um, I had my students respond to the Robert E. Lee monument because it's clear that, you know, it's become a rallying point for white supremacists. But if you take it away, right, you, it's, we fall into the danger of the art of the victor. Right and and this monolithic story and saying we're only going to have you know, we're, we're going to erase every difficult image. So what so what do you do with that? You have to make it you have to make a difficult intervention on it. Is what you have to do. It can't stand the way it is, but it can't just be taken away either. Right. So the narrative is not an attempt for closure. I hate that that term closure when people talk about you know I need that this this thing has led to I have a sense of closure. I think it's such a false and dishonest way of talking about trauma. But I think what you guys are talking about is narratives that aren't that, that aren't about closure, but rather about re-living in an aesthetic, aestheticized form, though. Because, yeah, I mean, your images never, are beautiful. Wounds that never got, like, like the 40,000 um, 
uh, Irishman who died in World War I who really never got mourned. There's not a single, you know, there's not a single public monument. They were meant to be traitorous, but it was a huge number of, of, of people. And I think what we were dealing there, it's, it, was a, it's a, it was a long overdue mourning because that's also a kind of festering wound when you can't be allowed to mourn. Yeah, and I think there are two kinds uh, to follow up on what Sheila's saying. And it's a great question, by the way, a terrific question. It goes to the very heart of what we're trying to do and what we're, we're grappling with. Um, in a way, you know, the, 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 it is about opening the scars and revisiting the wounds in order to re-scar. It is about that. And therefore, it is about pain and ugliness. I mean, think of Picasso's Guernica. It's not beautiful. Salan's poetry is all truncated and syncopated and cut up. Um, so there is estrangement, you know, definitely. Brecht is very relevant here. Um, going back to open the wound, which medically, you know, the Asclepian tradition is going back to, but even in the Hippocratic, uh, when, when there is a festering, a festering wound needs to be reopened so that it breathes again, and then it can have a proper scarring. Um, so, so it's a kind of a movement back and forth between the movement and the scar. And then there's two ways, I think, of scarring, like there's two modes of commemoration. One is a scarring that goes too quickly and covers itself up with a monument, right? And that doesn't read the monument as a scar, which, which yeah. speaks a wound, but forgets the wound. So that the wound acts itself out in the monumental, right? The beautiful, the victorious, the glorious, the micro, uh, sorry, the macro narrative. Um, or it simply says nothing at all. Like, you know, Hitler said to his, his uh, SS in Swanzee Convention, nothing is to be said about Auschwitz. Nothing. It's never to be spoken about. Nobody will know. We will not leave a trace. That's another way of covering the wound by no monuments at all. So you can under memorialize or over memorialize, and in between, you've got the proper scar tissue. Scarring being seen also, you know, as, as a mode of writing, a mode of drawing, a mode of stitching and weaving. Mm -hmm. It's textuality, you know, the textum mm -hmm. as the webbing which art does uh, in terms of images and, and, and poetry does in terms of words. But that's an excellent question about the relationship between scar and wound. And art having to be not just beautiful, but what Kant would say, beautiful and sublime, because the sublime deals with kind of the ugly and the impossible and that which, which does not allow for sort of rational understanding and clear and distinct explanations where we can say QED, now we don't have to deal with that anymore. Sometimes I do worry that we're too pretty, too. That some of the things are just too picturesque. Well, I think we botch enough things. You heard about us? I think we got enough things wrong. I didn't, the wrong my, I didn't have my black ink brush today. It's usually a little darker <laughs> at the end. Yeah. yeah, back there. Uh, first of all, uh, it's an amazing format that you created. This kind of narrative art uh, performance lecture. Um, the healing of the trauma and the scarring and then the reopening and the repetition of that that we have to continually do over time um, from a new place and time and to view it again in a different way and heal it again in a different way but inevitably to open it again mm -hmm. um, is that the, that that finite frailty of humanity that we will continuously do so in an attempt to heal it to a point of a lack of scar, though inevitably we never will? Mm. That's a great question too. Um, my, my quick response would be, and I need a lot of time to think more about it, that, I, I, you know, it's, it's coming back to the opening distinction maybe between healing and, and curing. Curing, which is the Hippocratic method of doing things, wants to say, okay, here you are, Prozac or whatever. Uh, this is the remedy that will get you out of here and you never have to think about it again. 
but it doesn't go back to the root of the problem. I mean, it's, it's very important, you know, I've taken it myself, I wouldn't do without it, but um, it doesn't deal with the other side of things. It's the Hippocratic answer, and, and you know, insurance companies love it because it's very, you manage pain, you explain pain, and you deal with pain, and you cure it. And the quicker you can cure it, the better. But the thing about healing is it never ends. The healing never ends. And I mean, what you need is actually curing and healing. It's not like they're, you know, the, the two brothers need to talk to each other. So is that when we're actually uh, experiencing that sublimity is when we are consciously aware of the fact that we have to perform and experience the mourning yeah. and the healing yeah. and then the trauma again. So we are actually consciously knowing that we're going to have this uh, panorama of experience mm. and it's uh, realizing the inevitability of that, that you actually, um, uh, you, you heal it better. You, you heal yourself mm -hmm. better uh, with the ability to actually experience that fully. Correct. And it, as long as we're mortal, the first traumatism is birth, right? I mean, we need to distinguish, obviously, between small, lowercase and higher case. I mean, higher case traumas are, you know, Holocaust, rape, tsunami, earthquake, Florida, what, Florida, what happened yesterday. That's, you know, but the, 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 the French philosopher Levinas says, you know, birth is the traumatisme originel, that our, 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 our being born into the world just that radical experience of separation for a child is the first dealing with shock horror. And it's because of that that we're all capable, actually, of recognizing wounds, maybe big trauma wounds in others, which we couldn't recognize unless we acknowledge our finitude and our mortality. And that's kind of the story of the Greek, of Odysseus, you know, recognizing a scar in Oedipus's wounded foot. Uh, it is that they become wounded healers by acknowledging their own wounds they can they can heal others. And that there is no cure. It's incurable. I mean, the human condition is incurable. There's no cure for death. Um, and acknowledging your death is, and your mortality is actually the best way to become a healer for yourself and for others. But it is a recurring thing. But it's not a repetition backwards, which would be um, melancholy, a fixation. And a kind of a closure, you're, you're fixated in this repetition backwards. It's a repetition forwards. But uh, great question. Lovely, yes. thank you. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> All right, so Ian, like, there's an implication, like from your first part of your talk, the story of the escaping us in the guy's sent car, guy's name. Chiron. Chiron. But there's like an implication that we can never heal ourselves. We are reliant on external forces to heal us. That we have to rely on others, we have to rely on others external rituals, and right, which is, I don't know if that's like an like optimistic thing to say or like a negative, like the creations that we never like sort of heal. I would, I would say we, if one of the things that's really drawn me to, I'm sorry, I didn't have more images of, I made 789 or in community, actually, I didn't make them. I, there were, over the course of the summer, I invited people in who had ailments or loved ones who had ailments, we made 789 anatomical votives out of clay and cement, all these different things. One of the things that really drew me to the concept of the Asclepion Temple is that there, it's both. It's relational, right? It's individuals getting healed in community. So there was theater, there was music, but you knew when it was the right time for you to, you had to have a, developed an inner ear and an inner sense. You knew when it was the right time for you to go to the healing temple. And then you had, a, there's nothing, so you were in, it was individuals in community with art objects, but then you had the ultimate, which I think is the ultimate private experience, which is there's nothing more individual and nothing potentially more healing than sleep. We don't have, you know, you might know what other people's marriages are kind of like, or sex, or eating, but nobody knows what other people's dreams or sleep are like. It's the most private thing I think we do. And these sleeping on temples, we're asking that most private part of ourselves, our sleep and our unconscious and our dreams, to teach us, to heal us. But then there were these other people who were your dream interpreters as well. The other thing is the notion of, which I kind of relates back to the other question, that the anatomical votives were done in um, 
petition, but also in gratitude. And the notion, a huge number of the anatomical votives that were left in the temples um, were left there. Presumably, a lot of these people with their breast cancer or their broken foot were not cured, but on some level, they perceived themselves as healed. And that's when they left hundreds, thousands. And this didn't go on for like 20 years. It was like a big practice for a thousand years. It worked mm. on some level. So Yeah, I just had one thing. I know there's two or three other people trying to come in, so I'll be very brief. But uh, 100%. I think it's both. I think, it's, yeah. I think it is outside and inside. Yeah. And also, I think wounded healers although they know they can't cure or be cured themselves, in healing others, they heal themselves. Mm. And I mean, you know, a, a great therapist or a great doctor will always say, if you say, thank you very much for healing me, uh, they'll always say, in healing you, I'm healing myself. It's, it's an extraordinary paradox, you know, that it goes both ways. But I think there were two other people who had their hands up. I was supposed to keep track of this, and I failed. Um, go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks for your talk and presentation. I really liked your use of the phrase, the past repeated forward, which you brought up in the context of Freud, but of course that's a Kierkegaardian phrase. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of your talk could just be viewed as a commentary on what that means, although I invite you to say a little bit more about the phrase if you have anything more to say right now. I also, secondly, wanted to get back to something you brought up early and return to late which was talking about pity and fear. And I wondered why fear ought to be transmuted in the way that you say it should, because it sounded more like an overcoming of fear. And if we go back to the poetics, we have reason to fear for ourselves and for those whom we love, because you know, our condition is one of being vulnerable to tragedy, to trauma, let's say. OK, two great questions. Let me begin with the latter one, and you know, we could have a a whole evening discussing Aristotle and, and the interpretations of Aristotle's pity and fear. Um, as I understand it, he's saying that these are the two most fundamental drives, pity and fear. And they're totally natural, they're totally normal, that's how we survive and so on, yes. But what drama does is it frees us to live fear serenely. Because what fear does is it draws you back from things. When you fear, you, re you withdraw. And there's a good and a bad way of withdrawing. The bad way is to fear in such a way that you deny the cause of your fear, and you block it out, or you become indifferent to it. Or you hate it by scapegoating it and turning it into something radically external, strange, and unfamiliar. That's pathological fear, very understandable. We do it all the time. But that, inauthentic fear, whereas serenity is taking a distance, but it's the detachment, think of Yeats' poem, um, uh, gaiety transfiguring all that dread, right? And he's, it's in Lapis Lazuli, it's that sort of serene Japanese Zen master sage looking down at everything unfolding and instead of from a distance recoiling from it, in the moment of withdrawal, having a sort of a compassionate, serene detachment. So that's how I see it, you know, rightly, wrongly, that there's this, this not denial of, of fear, but a transforming of fear as a distancing, and, and pity being the other extreme of getting totally fused with pain and suffering, so that there's no distinction at all. I mean, you can imagine a doctor would be hopeless if they practice pity of that kind. My brother actually was a palliative care doctor uh, working in hospices. He, he, he wrote a piece called Exquisite Empathy. That we need empathy, but it has to be exquisite because if it's being the exquisite balance between distance and, and nearness. Because if you, if you take on the other's pain, you can't sleep, you can't live, uh, you can't actually heal them because you just break down with them, you know, particularly in, in tragic cancers and so on and so forth. So th th that's a long way of replying to your excellent question. I'm sure I haven't done it justice. The first part, could you remind me again? Simply about the past repeated. Oh yeah, it's very Kierkegaardian. Yeah, and I was, I was sort of slightly attributing it to Freud, but it is, I mean, it's a paraphrase of, of Kierkegaard. And, and two kinds of time. I mean, it's both repetition. That repetition seems bad, but it's, it's bad when you repeat backwards. Now, Kierkegaard sees it as Greek repetition is backwards because it doesn't have a sense of the future, which Christianity introduces. 
But without going into you know, the Christian versus the Greek, which is Kierkegaard's you know, uh, distinction in his little piece, Repetition, it's that there's a way of repeating. We're always going to be repeating the past, but there's one way of doing it where we're driven and determined by the past. Even if we deny the past, it acts out through us and comes to ghost us again and again. So that's repetition backwards, as opposed to saying, OK, bring on the ghosts and let's name them as our ancestors. And in that sense, we can repeat forward. But it's, you can't deny the past. You repeat the past, you reiterate the past, you retrieve the past, but this time moving forward. Now, Kierkegaard called that the movement from chronological to chirological, but that would, you know, in the notion of grace and, and, and wonder and opening, um, which is another day's work, but not irrelevant also to healing, you know. But it brings in, it brings in the religious too and the spiritual, which is important. Ishida, do you want to add anything to that? So, um, and, and I think maybe we just take. Uh, yeah, I think we're, just this. I think okay. we're probably down to our last one. I'm going to be very time. quick. I know people need to get home. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for a beautiful, compelling presentation, particularly poignant uh, given the circumstances we gather in today. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of place and the transferability of scars, and particularly this place in the Front Range where we have. I mean, untold violence. Uh, recently, we've had, you know, the, the Aurora Theater shooting. We had the Columbine massacre. Uh, going back, we had the Ludlow massacre. And, and then, of course, the Sand Creek massacre, which is often forgotten, in some cases deliberately forgotten. And I'm wondering about the transferability of the scar. Can we, as Craig put it, poke at a scar that we don't recognize as our own? And who has essentially, you know, the... the power or the control in that equation, um, it's something that I wrestle with personally. I would love to hear your, your thoughts on that. It's a, it's a terrific question, Sheila. Too <laughs> <laughs> hard for me. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. Richard. You'll be the father of us. Bring up slavery in this box. Yeah, no, but I, I, I think the issue of, yeah, of what is appropriate transferability is really, is really a, a serious one. And um, I, why do you think we go to the Greeks? Why, like everybody can jointly own the, own the Greeks. It's an, it's an, it's an easy, uh, it's, it's an easy and safe way to, to do things. I think as Amer as Americans, we, we, we do sh share this history of multiple wounds, multiple injustices, multiple genocides, um, so that as Americans, we can definitely, I feel like there is a transferability in terms of, of, the, of the looking and the talking and the discussing and the opening of, of the wound. Um, I feel, I mean, partially because I've done a lot of work with Civil War imagery, the Civil War archive, I mean, that's a, a, a perfect example of one that if, like every single American needs to own our unfinished processing of the Civil War. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, Sheila and Richard, thank for our fantastic.